Welcome everyone. Do we have any new people here? Can you put your hand up if you're new to being here with me? Okay, two, welcome to you. I guess we're all new if we're present, isn't that correct? And that's what awakening is. Awakening is all about liberating yourself from the past and future world of the mind, liberating yourself from those endless thoughts that never seem to stop, liberating yourself from the illusion of separation, and liberating yourself from the world of illusion, liberating yourself from all of that into the truth of life, which is revealed through this moment. That's it. The only moment that's ever really available to us is this moment. And when that simple truth settles in, everything begins to change. You know where the truth is. It's here now. It's you present with what is here in this moment. And slowly, slowly you become more and more grounded in the present moment more and more deeply rooted into the present moment. And when you're present, your mind is silent. When you're present, there are no problems. There's no conflict. There's no fear. There's no desire. You're just here, present with what is here. And the great irony is that being present is the simplest thing. It is so absurdly simple. What have we all been fussing about? From the days of Buddha onwards, or before Buddha. They missed it with Buddha, they missed it with Jesus, they're probably still missing it with Ramana. What are we fussing about? It's so simple to be present. It's as simple as bringing yourself present with something that is here in the moment with you. And the moment you're truly present with something that's actually here, you can see it, hear it, feel it, taste it, touch it or smell it. The moment you're truly present with something that's here, you come out of the mind. Because mind is past future, now you're present. Thoughts stop without you even trying to stop thoughts. Because thoughts are always past future, but now you're present. And the moment you're present with something that's here, you don't have to stay present with something that's here. Now you're present with everything. Wherever you look, you're present. Your body is breathing. You're present with what is here, awake in the world of here now, rather than lost in the world of not here. Because that's where most of us live. We live in the world of not here. That's pretty shocking. We live in the world of not here. We live in, our, in the world of our thoughts, our memories, our imaginings. The world of not here. And then we get lost in the world of not here. And then we find ourselves imprisoned in the world of not here. 
and we can't find our way back to the world of here now. But the world of here now, the present moment, it's here all the time. It never goes away. It's waiting for you. These flowers are waiting for you. They're saying, will you not be present with me? I'm here. Will you be here? No, no, don't bother me. I'm trying to get enlightened. <laughs> no, don't bother me. I have to practice my meditations. Or recite my mantras. Don't disturb me in my dream. I'm trying to make my dream a happy dream. Do not disturb me. <laughs> it's a very miserable dream, but I have hopes that it will become a happy dream and I will not give up. This is what keeps us imprisoned in the world of the mind. That hope of future fulfillment. That belief that the dream will get better. But all that, re all that happens is you remain in the dream. And sometimes the dream is good and sometimes it's not so good. But you live for those good moments in the dream. And you run from those not so good moments. And you remain imprisoned. In a world of illusion, a world of not here. That's the human dilemma. And the great irony is that being present is so simple. Your body is breathing. Be present with it. Be aware of it breathing. There's sound in each moment. Be present. Hear the sound. The sound of my voice. Or this. Who is present hearing the sound? I am. Who is present aware of the body breathing? I am. Who is present looking out these eyes? I am. Who is, who is here now? But you have to really be here. <laughs> you can't say that if you're not here. That would be cheating. Being present is the easy part. Now, what's the more uh, complex or difficult part? Remaining present as we live our lives, as we uh, engage in our relationships, as we go to work. That's not so easy to remain present, is it? So that's the next part of the awakening, which is arising in mastery of your mind and ego. You're not truly awake until you're fundamentally present and arisen in mastery of your mind and ego. When you're a master of your mind and ego, you're no longer identified with your story. You still have a story. You still have a dream. You still sometimes play in that story, but you don't live in it. You're not identified with it. You know it for what it is. It's just memory and imagining. That's okay. You can still use your mind, but you don't get lost in your mind. And you are so present, you are so awake, you are so conscious, that there's virtually no way that the mind and ego can pull you out of the present moment. It just can't do it anymore. And then there comes a point when the ego recognizes that. I can't fool this dude anymore. <laughs> I can't catch him into the past. I, I've always been able to do that so easily. A little regret, a little resentment, a little blame. He's in the past. I've always been able to get him into the future. That's so easy. The promise of future fulfillment, easy. Even the promise of enlightenment in the future, no problem. Almost everyone falls for that one. But there comes a point as you settle into presence and you arise in mastery of your mind and ego where the ego itself recognizes that the true master is here. Finally, finally, the true master is here. Who is the true master? I am. 
It is that dimension of you that is of this moment and only of this moment. And the irony is, it has always been here. It always will be, always has been, and is in this moment. You're already a fully awakened being at the center. But to the extent that you're absorbed into the world of the mind, you disconnect from the truth that is ever present at the center of your being. The more absorbed you get, the more lost you get in your story, the more you disconnect for, from the truth that is ever present. The more you repress the feelings, the more you disconnect from the truth. The more you lose yourself in seeking love or acceptance, approval, recognition, the more you disconnect from the center, which is the truth of who you are. So this teaching covers both of those aspects. How do we become present instantly beyond all practice? And how do we gradually arise in mastery of the mind and ego? Okay, does anyone have a question or a sharing? If not, we'll go to our rather long list from our webcast people. But you have the first right of refusal. <laughs> okay, you refuse. No, you don't. Okay, <laughs> let's pass it down here. And we don't have amplification, but the microphone goes into the video. Okay. And if you could hold the microphone, did they show you how to, how yeah, to hold it? Yeah, I think so. Good. Okay. So good. okay. Um, so there's a man that I, um, I trust in this, whatever we call this, trying to wake up thing. He's made it somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, he gave me an, an idea of a thing called, he calls it like ego one and ego two. And there are times when I'm, I think that I'm witnessing myself or observing myself. But it really is this more, I think he's right, it's just another facet of ego. It's just ego looking at ego. And so when I hear, when you're talking about like being present, I've done that so many times. I'm going to eat my cereal mindfully. And it just, it feels like bullshit. It's just another shuck and jive that I do that's a lateral move at best. And so... Why are you eating your cereal in presence? <laughs> What's the point of that? Because... What will that get you? Well, it's an attempt to do what you've just described. Be present. So you're trying to accomplish that state that I was describing? Yes. Oh. And when will you accomplish that? How long will you have to eat your cereal in presence? I... I have a feeling that misses the mark. I don't think that's ever going to work. I think it's always going to be me mimicking presence. Well, that's a pretty defeatist attitude, is it not? That's an interesting limiting belief that will prevent you from really waking up. See, what's happening is you're trying to be present mm -hmm. and there's an ego agenda in your being present. You've read a lot of books, you've been to a lot of teachers, you know where you're supposed to be, you know what it's supposed to be like, you know what you're supposed to do, you're doing your best, I don't doubt your sincerity, but your ego is involved in your being present. It has an agenda, a subtle agenda. So, let me speak to your ego. What's your name? Just your first name? My name's Christian. Christian. Okay, can I speak to Christian's ego, yes or no? Yes. Okay, so... Christian's ego, what do you hope to achieve by uh, eating the, present, uh, eating the uh, cereal in a present manner? What's the point of that for you, ego? Come on. 
You know, I, I the Enlightenment Project. It's what I've been doing for for ten years now. Oh, well, that's it, a great project. So, uh, I take it, ego, that you're interested in becoming enlightened. Is that correct? Correct. Good. And you've been trying very hard. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Would you say you've been fairly sincere and committed to this project? I've been sincere. Not necessarily committed. Um, if it's a disciplined thing, I'm not going to make it. No. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Good, Eco. Well, would you like the good news or the bad news, Eco? Which one would you like first? Yeah, the bad. You want the bad news? <laughs> okay, I'll give you the bad news first. So, Eco. First of all, I honor you for trying so hard and for so long. Ten years is a long time trying to wake up, trying to be enlightened, right? So here's the bad news. You're never, ever going to get it. You're never, ever going to be awake or enlightened. It is not going to happen for you, ego. That's the bad news. How do you feel about that? You're allowed to fight me too, Ego. Well, you know what? I don't like my ego a whole hell of a lot to begin with, to be honest with now you. This so. is the ego saying it doesn't like itself. Yeah, that's true. That's all I have. That's There's all nothing you have. else. There's nothing else. If there is, I've never touched it or seen it. Or Well, would you be willing to accept nothing else? How about nothing? Are you willing to give up everything for nothing, yes or no? I'll take that as a no. Yeah, probably no, because... Okay. okay, this is just playful. This is not serious. Okay. I'm, I'm dialoguing with your ego in a very genuine way, and I'm giving the ego the bad news. It's not going to wake up. It doesn't matter how much it tries. It's not going to happen. Let me ask you, ego, uh, a couple more questions. What would be the point of waking up or becoming enlightened for you, ego? What's, th what's good about that for you? What will that accomplish? What will it accomplish for you or for Christian? You tell me. Well, like you said in the beginning, there'd be no, you said there are no problems. So you're trying to get rid of problems. That's a big part of it. Good. What else? If there's a way of seeing things that I don't see, I'd like to know the truth if I have to be here. Well, you're not going to. Sorry. Now, do you want the good news? I don't think you're that interested in the good news. No, I just, I, you I'm just a pessimist in my heart, but yeah, let's, I'm ready. I'd ready? Like, I would like some good news, actually. Like okay, okay. So I'll repeat the bad news, then I'll give you the good news. Okay, so the bad news is it doesn't, doesn't matter how much you try, ego. doesn't matter how many teachers you go to, how many books you read, or how many spiritual practices you do, for how many lifetimes. You are not going to get it, ego. You're not going to wake up. You're not going to be enlightened. It's not going to happen for you, ego. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. You can stop trying. You can relax. It's not part of the plan that you, ego, should awaken. That's not your role. All you have to do is relax. And suddenly, he's here. But you want to keep doing it. How do you feel about allowing him to be present? His mind is silent. He's utterly present. How's that for you? How do you feel about that? He awakens and you don't. How do you feel about that? Come on, ego. I mean, it sounds good. Good. Then just relax. You, go, you relax. No, you're still trying. And Christian? Be present with any one of those flowers behind me. I don't care which one it is. No trying, though. I'm watching every m moment to see if you're trying. Just be present. All you need, so you're still trying. Be present with the flower. Here it is. Now, the flower is here. And you're here. It's too simple. The flower wants nothing from you. The flower doesn't care whether it's enlightened. It's just here. And you're just here. Even if it's just for a moment, you're just here. There's no outcome. There's no accomplishment. There's no enlightenment. You're just here. In this moment, present with the flower. Are you present in this moment, yes or no? Just one word. 
Good. This is it. Now be present with me. I want nothing from you, you want nothing from me. I'm here, you're here. Now while you're present with me, be present with your body breathing. Your body loves it when you're present, aware of the body breathing. There's no outcome. If you're really present, your mind is silent in, in this moment, just this moment. Is your mind silent in this moment, yes or no? Yes. Good. Okay, now this is it. Now your ego will say, this is nothing. Your ego will dismiss this because it doesn't want you to be present. It wants you to keep looking. Because if you keep looking, keep searching, keep seeking, you stay in the world of not here. You stay in the past and future where the ego is running your show. But when you just relax and you're present, it's so simple. Now you're here. Now I'm not saying you're here permanently because there is no permanent. But I can say in this moment, you're here. In this moment, just this moment, you are an awakened being. This is it. Now the ego will come in and say, this is nothing. And I would say to the ego, yes, that is correct. Good. Okay. So we'll leave it there. But if whatever you think about this is not it. Every thought you have is coming from your mind and ego. No matter how brilliant the thought, no matter how spiritual the thought. I'm not saying the thought should stop, not at all. But you, the truth of you, needs to recognize a thought for what it is, or a belief for what it is. That's all they are, just beliefs, thoughts. Jetsam and flotsam. But it's only, uh, only going to be a matter of time before the ego will jump back in and reclaim you. And that's okay too. That's part of the process. And then slowly, slowly you master, you, you, uh, master the art of witnessing your ego. You have to know, what is your ego? How does it function? Why does it function? What is its true role in your life? Why does it resist presence? How do you overcome its resistance? You cannot defeat the ego. Okay? Good. Okay. <coughs> okay, does anyone else have a question? Was that helpful to hear that? Okay, Mary, would you like to go to the list? Oh, can we pass the microphone back, please? This question is from Abby from Panaji, Goa, India. And her question is, in my own experience, when I move more deeply into myself, which is presence, invariably there seems to be a contrary movement happening in response. The thoughts, feelings get so agitated, and then they quiet down on their own after a while of fluttering around. My question is, why does that happen? And will that eventually stop? Okay, that's a very good question. Can anyone relate to that question? Mm -hmm. What's her name again, Mary? Abby. Abby. I guess that could be a he or a her, I don't know. Okay, so there are two reasons for that occurring, Abby. The first is, as you become present and you start to deepen into presence, you're coming more and more into the body. 
being present is a very embodied state. And as you come more and more into the body, more and more present in the body, you're going to start to get in touch with all the repressed feelings that are held and stored within the body. All the unresolved issues, emotional wounds that are stored within the body. So as you become present, it's quite natural that you'll encounter these difficult feelings. And uh, a part of this teaching is to show, is to demonstrate or, or share how to be in right relationship with these feelings when they come up. The answer is pretty simple. When these feelings surface because you're becoming more present, you have to be present with the feeling, but not get lost in the story that the feeling is telling you. The story is always from the past. So you have to master the art of allowing the feeling, feel the feeling, be present with the feeling, maybe allow the feeling expression, maybe you get angry, maybe you cry, whatever it is. You even let the feeling tell the story, but you're present enough, you're awake enough, that you're not identifying with the story that the feeling is revealing. And that's not possible until there's a certain level of presence awake in you. Because you have to be able to play two roles at the same time. On the, on the one hand, I'm someone who's feeling all this pain, or this anger, or this hurt, or this need. And I'm really feeling it. It's authentic, I'm feeling it, because it's coming up. Which is a good thing, because previously it was repressed. Now it's coming up into consciousness. It's releasing, that's a good thing. On the other hand, you're an eternal being, witnessing the whole play as it opens up within you. It's like a play, it's like a movie. So you're both at the same time, but you can't be both at the same time until there's a certain level of presence awake in you. That's why step one is mastering the art of being present. Many times each day, you very gently rem remember to be present. You notice you're in your mind, no problem. No effort, no struggle, no trying, but you gently bring yourself present with something that is here in the moment. Many times each day, and it has to be gentle. No struggle, no effort, no trying. Oh, I'm daydreaming, now I'm back. Very simple. Then presence will start to open more and more within you, and then you can begin this process of, of allowing the feelings to surface without being lost in the story. So that's the first reason these feelings are coming up. And it's a very positive thing. It's a good thing because you can't awaken with all these feelings repressed within you. Jesus gave us a clue when he said, Whosoever is angry with his brother, first go and reconcile with your brother, then bring the gift to the altar. He's saying don't come to the altar of presence, of God, of love, with unresolved issues. Resolve them. Allow all these things to surface. Bring them all to consciousness. The second reason these things are arising is also very natural and a very uh, natural part of the process of awakening. As you become present, you've escaped the clutches of the ego or it's relaxed for a while and allowed you to be present and you feel so wonderful. It feels so peaceful. You feel liberated. Maybe even a little bliss. And a lot of peace. But it's not long before the ego starts to freak out. What about me? I'm being abandoned. I brought you this far. I did all the practices. Years, ten years of practice. Now you think you're going to abandon me and leave me here? I don't think so, says the ego. So the ego will bring in all sorts of thoughts and feelings and agitations to pull you out of the present moment. And again, a part of the process of awakening is from presence you become more and more aware, more and more a witness to the subtle movements of the ego. And from presence you come into right relationship with the ego. 
The ego will never relax, it will never surrender, it will never let go until you come into right relationship with it. You cannot defeat the ego, it is impossible. And you cannot come into right relationship with the ego until you're present or until there's a sufficient level of presence awake in you. Because when you're present, you are love. That's who you are. You are acceptance. You are compassion. You are without judgment. You allow. And this is the energy you bring to the ego. This is right relationship with the ego. And the ego will test you. It's not going to just immediately surrender. It will test you. Is this really the true master? Can I trust this? It will test you with the test of judgment. Can I catch you into judgment? Can I get you to judge me, says the ego. Try and get rid of me. That's a judgment. Can I get you to judge any aspect of yourself? Try and get rid of any aspect of yourself or even fix any aspect of yourself. That's a judgment. You're not the true master, says the ego. But when you're truly present, judgment is not there. It's simply not there. And so uh, there'll come a point where the ego will recognize the arising of the true master from within. The true master is not outside of you. It's at the center of your being. And gradually the ego will relax and it will give up trying to pull you out of the present moment. And its role in your life will then be radically transformed in a most beautiful way. There's a teaching out there that says that with enlightenment, the ego is annihilated. Or it disappears or it's gotten rid of. Most unhelpful teaching. That's not going to happen, ego. Any ego that's listening at the moment, any ego listening into me, that will not happen. You're not going to be annihilated, eliminated, or got, gotten rid of, or even abandoned. It's not the plan. So those are the two reasons that's happening for you, Abby, and uh, it makes perfect sense. It's very natural. It's part of the process of awakening. And it just means you have to bring more consciousness to these things as they arise within you with love, acceptance and compassion. You are all fully awakened beings. You just have to relax into it. And if you're trying to understand what I'm saying with your mind, it won't work. Your mind cannot know the truth that I'm speaking. But you can. Your ego cannot know the truth, but you can. Which you am I addressing? Which you am I speaking to? You are the truth. Which you am I speaking to? I'm speaking to that dimension of you that is of this moment. It's not even accurate to say dimension of you. It's that you that is of this moment and only of this moment. Who is of this moment? I am. I am. Who is here? I am. Who is love?
Okay, Mary, shall we proceed? Does anyone else have a question? Please feel free to raise your hand if you do. This question is from Sam from Warrington, Pennsylvania. How do you stay in the present moment as you move through life? Okay, I've kind of answered that. You begin by being present when there is no life. Life is an illusion. There's only this moment. What life? There's just this moment. And you can be here in this moment. So you begin here. You begin by being present in this moment and recognizing at a very deep level that this is the only moment there is available to you. Just this moment. There's no expression, no movement, no doing. You're just sitting. You're present with your body breathing. You're present with the sound you hear. Present with the feeling of the chair against your back. You're just here. then maybe you venture into life, or what we call life. Maybe you walk from your chair where you've been sitting quietly and being very present, and you walk into the kitchen, and you begin to wash the dishes. Didn't I wash the dishes tonight, Mary? Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> But you venture into the kitchen and as you're washing the dishes, you're present as you lift the dish. You're present as you feel the warmth of the water. You're present with what is here. You're present with what you see. You're present with the smell of the soap. You're present. Then you finish washing the dishes. You decide to go for a little walk. So you're present as you go for a walk. And you're present with the tree that you're passing by. Or the little uh, flower on the side of the road or the cloud drifting by. You notice a bird, you're present with the bird flying. Then you decide to get in your car and drive to the local supermarket. And you can even be present as you walk up and down the aisles of the supermarket. Yes, you've got your shopping list. Yes, you're thinking about what you want to buy. But you can also have those moments of deep presence as you walk along the aisle. In other words, you can be present anywhere, anytime. But then, trouble, <laughs> big, big trouble. You encounter a, one of those humans. <laughs> <laughs> big trouble. You know you're about to get lost. You're going to get lost into the mind, lost in your story, lost in their story, <laughs> lost in your opinions, lost in their expectations, their resentments, your anger, and now all of it's gone. Your enlightenment has disappeared. <laughs> <clears throat> so that's when the work begins. You begin the process with what I call two s the, the second step in this teaching. You begin the process of bringing consciousness to how you get pulled out of presence in these situations. What happened? You take responsibility. What is it in you that is allowing you to get pulled out of the present moment? Is it your needing acceptance? That'll pull you out. Are you seeking love? Are you looking for approval? Are you repressing your feelings? Are you judging yourself? Are you judging others? All these things will pull you out of the present moment. So you, you begin the process of bringing all of that to consciousness as it's happening. You're not trying to stop it. You're not trying to change it. You're not trying to get rid of it. You're just revealing it all in consciousness. This is step two. And slowly, slowly, you'll find you're getting pulled out less and less, even when you're engaging with those humans. <laughs> And maybe one day you might be fortunate enough to encounter a human being. Which means a human who is present. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and you'll feel great joy. The good, the good news is there are more and more human beings walking upon the planet. But still a great preponderance of humans. Okay. Uh, this next is a comment from Robert from Australia. And Robert says, just to say, I ordered the Mount Madonna retreat recently and absolutely loved it. It's rewarding confronting, uplifting, inspiring. Well, I can continue with a lengthy train of adjectives, but I haven't much time, so I shall stop. I can't thank you enough for your wonderful work. With love, Rob. Okay, thank you, Rob from Australia. And that's a good little advertisement for our tiny little flash drive, <laughs> which has 13 hours of video and 13 hours of audio on it from the retreat from uh, maybe two years ago or one year ago. So thank you, Rob, and I'm glad you're enjoying it. Would you like to continue? This next question is from Almasto, <coughs> from the city of here, the state of now, and the country of presence. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Almasto. I hope he's. I hope he's listening. He's got a great question. He says, Leonard, it's becoming clearer and clearer to me that no one really wants to be here. We all seem to have our own version of, and I quote, anywhere but here. What's up with that? <laughs> <laughs> What's up with that is very, very simple. Well, maybe not so simple. The first reason would be that we humans are deeply and profoundly addicted to thinking. It is our greatest addiction, and it is a far stronger addiction than addiction to heroin, alcohol, sex, gambling, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> and the truth is, we humans are addicted to thinking. We can't stop. And what motivates us and drives us into our addiction to thinking is exactly the same motivation that drives anyone into any addiction, whether it's heroin, alcohol, gambling, or whatever. And it's the desire to avoid the pain. What's the pain? What is at the root of the pain for all of us? It's the pain of living in a world where no one's truly present. That's at the core of all pain. It's at the center of all pain. The pain of living in separation. What are we separate from? Well, we're separate from the present moment, which is the truth of life. We're separate from the truth of who we are. We're all lost in our separate worlds and we'll do anything to avoid the pain of that. And one of the ways that we've devised to avoid the pain is to think our way out of the pain. It's a habit that began many, many, many lifetimes ago. Maybe that lifetime when you were being stretched on the rack it was too painful. I'm out of here. Well, where are you going to go? Into the mind to escape. But we humans forgot to come back. It became a habit. So that's the first reason why very few people are unable to or don't really want to become present. There's another reason, a second reason, which is, and I'd probably say a third of the human population, maybe a quarter, has come in to, the, to physical incarnation with a, a deep, deep resistance to being here. I don't want to be here. Why are you sending me down here? This is hell down here. What did I do to deserve this? I don't want to be here. We actually come in with that belief, that feeling, that resistance, and it comes from the soul. I don't want to come here. There's too much suffering. It's too painful. It's too difficult. And here's the catch. As long as that belief, which came in <laughs> at the point of conception, as long as that belief is there and subtly within you at a very unconscious level, that will act as a real obstacle to your awakening because awakening is all about being here. So that would be the second reason. The third reason would be the ego itself. 
The ego would love you to be spiritual. It would love to pursue enlightenment. It would love to be enlightened. But it doesn't know anything about being present. Even if that sounds attractive to the ego. Maybe it read the power of now or something like that. The ego will think, oh, that's good. But if you find your way to the present moment, the ego is not going to like it. Because when you're present, the mind falls silent. And when the mind falls silent, the ego is no longer in control. And the ego feels threatened by that, uncomfortable with that. And if you're really deeply silent and present, the ego might even feel like it's disappearing or dissolving. And the ego won't permit that. So there are many, many reasons why we humans appear to not want to be here. But I can tell you at a deeper level, beloved Olmosto, you rascal. <laughs> at a deeper level, the deepest longing of the soul is to truly be here. The deepest longing of the soul is to come home. The problem is the soul doesn't know where home is. And it's through your efforts in this lifetime that the soul can actually find its way home through you. And that home is the door is revealed through the doorway of the present moment. It, re it reveals the eternal. It reveals oneness. It reveals heaven on earth. That's the true homecoming for the soul. And it's the deepest longing in all of us. It's basically a, a, the deepest longing to return to God. The problem is for many of us, we think God's up there or back there, somewhere other than here now. And that's our mistake. Okay. Let's pass the microphone to Jessica. So um, the second reason that you mentioned about not wanting to be here, that it's too painful, or too hard. And I feel like I'm in that category and you know how far I've come and mm -hmm. where I've been and where I am now. But there is always that feeling where I just don't want to be here or I can't wait to die right. and just go back into the arms of God and I realize you won't be going back into I, the arms of God. Right. So you want to know how to overcome that? Is that it? Okay. It's a very, very good question. If you're one of those <coughs> souls that at some very subtle, unconscious level has that deep, deep feeling, that deep, deep resistance to being here. I don't want to be here. Too much suffering here. Probably the first step is to actually express that. Bring that out to consciousness and, and make it very clear. Protest to God. Protest to the trees, to the flowers. Protest to the, to the sky. I don't want to be here. There's too much suffering. Tell your friends, I don't want to be here. Too much suffering. But then you have to elaborate. What's the suffering? You can't just generalize, what's the suffering? Too much rejection, too much judgment, no one's really here, not enough love, too much conflict, everyone wants to be right. Nobody sees me, nobody knows me, I'm alone. Am I on the right track? Mm -hmm. You've really got to bring that out and express it. Even at the retreats, for example, I really encourage people to bring that fight out. I don't want to be here. Walk around and really own, I don't want to be here. I refuse to be here. I hate being here. God, you screwed up. I was supposed to go up, not down. But this I'm is hell here. Wait, no, wait. That's the first step. Then the second step is to get really clear about what you're talking about when you say, I don't want to be here. For example, see these flowers here? Do you see them? I want you to be present with them for a moment. Really present with them. And I want you to say to the flowers, I don't want to be here with you. Can you say that? Is it true? Is it okay to be here with the flowers? Yes or no? 
Yes. No. So you don't mean the flowers, do you, when you say, I don't want to be here? Right. You don't mean the trees? No. How about the sky? No. How about pussycats? No. How about doggies? No. <laughs> Elephants? No. All animals. They're all okay. Mountains? Okay. That's okay too. Okay, so all of that's okay. When you say you don't want to be here, you don't mean all of that stuff, right? Right, correct. You mean unconscious humans. Yes. Is that what you mean? Then you owe the flowers a huge apology. You owe the mountains, the trees, the sky, the clouds. You owe them all a huge apology. I've been unconsciously rejecting you and saying, I don't want to be here. But I didn't mean you. I'm sorry. I'll be here with you. You start there. Does anybody get what I'm saying? Yeah. That could be the, most, the deepest and most profound meditation anyone could do. Do it for a week. Do it for a month. Just spend some time each day walking around and apologizing to the trees, the flowers, the sky, the mountain, the dog, the cat. I didn't mean you. I'm sorry. I meant them. <laughs> them. These humans. Unconscious humans that are lost in their, in their stories, believing in their stories, believing in their ideas and thoughts and opinions. And they even believe in their beliefs. They even believe in God. I didn't mean you flowers, I meant them. Does anybody get what I'm saying? Then that will shift that deep belief within you. It'll start to open up and shift. And it'll loosen up and you'll realize, wow, okay, now I'm clear. I do want to be here, but now I have to master how to be here with unconscious humanity. It's very important to always be in touch with what you're feeling. Don't try and fix it. Don't try and hide it. If necessary, you share what you're feeling. That can often help you become more present. You can share what you're feeling in one or two words. It doesn't have to be a story. What are you feeling, Christian? What's happening? Pass the microphone to Christian. It's always dangerous to sit in the front row. What's happening for you? Because I watch you come in and out of presence and I watch you disappear. So what's going on? Um, well, I've, when I've been here, I've been more in my body than I've been in a long time. I live in my head and I always have. And um, so it's been actually interesting to just kind of stay in my body um, just now when you noticed that I was in my head. My sister, I have a twin sister, and she's in the hospital tonight. And um, she's probably going to be okay, but um, I was thinking about her at that particular moment. Okay. All right. well, instead of thinking about her, why not be present? When you're present, you are love. That's who you are. And send a little love her way. How would that be? And it's effortless. You don't actually have to do anything. You just become present. And it's like you just just have the sense, just for a moment, it's just like, it's almost like you're directing the wind, just a little, and it's going towards her. Wherever she is, she'll instantly feel it. That's how powerful you are when you're present. That's who you are when you're present. Thinking about her doesn't help her, but you being present, you don't know what that does at invisible levels, right? Good. Okay, now you're back. Pass the microphone. Okay, this Mary. This question uh, is from Mary from Dallas, Texas. I find that as I get quieter and go deeper into my inner self, I tend to like staying there and enjoy the silence. It feels harder for me to move out and do things in the outside world. Sometimes I don't know if I'm wanting to avoid or deny the busy outside world or if it is normal to feel this way. Please comment. 
Okay. First of all, it's extremely normal to feel this way, Mary. And there are times when you really want to be alone and very quiet in nature. Can anyone relate to that? And you don't really want to do anything. And you have to trust that and go with that flow to the extent that you can manage it in your life in a practical way. You go with that. If you have to retire from the world for a week or a month or a few days, so be it. But there will also be a natural flow that will arise within you when it's time to re-emerge and participate and express in the world. And so you go with that flow also. Because there's no right or wrong. But I can tell you from my own experience, um, there were times when I couldn't possibly have participated in the world of time. It would have been completely out of the question, literally impossible. Primarily because there was no time. And to allow yourself that level of grace to relax into such a deep level of presence, you're literally gifting it to yourself or you're allowing that gift to come to you from God through grace. Just to settle into such a deep, quiet state of presence where you're really present with what's really here. Okay, let's have the microphone over here. So, I an earlier comment you made in the beginning when you were talking about teachings that say annihilation of the ego is you know or possible or something to be desired. That's very unhelpful. So, I, I think the reason I'm I I'm very drawn to the teachings of Ramana Maharshi. I read him a lot mm -hmm. for a long time. So, and he does say. Th kind of depth of the mind, so or, or depth of, of the mind, things of that. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to think like the mind is dead, or I, there are people well, in that, so, and that's kind of again what you were, you know, refer. So that's kind of confusing to me when he says, and what could he be well, first meaning of all, by that? Come back next time with the book so you can actually give me an accurate <laughs> quote of what <laughs> he said. Because if he said death of the mind dies, I'd have to, I'd have to say. Uh, Ramana, <laughs> sorry, you're wrong. <laughs> but I doubt very much whether he said that. And I doubt very much whether he said that the ego is annihilated, though he might have said that because that is very consistent with Hindu and Indian culture. And that's part of the mythology of, of enlightenment within, uh, within uh, India. You know, what we're looking for at this stage of human evolution is not that model of enlightenment where a very small few number of us awaken and live in a cave or become gurus and ashrams form around them. If that was to happen for everyone, there'd be who's going to be a disciple? <laughs> who's going to run the ashram? That's not really the model that's going to transform our world. The model that will transform our world is that we awaken very, very deeply to the level that Ramana spoke of, or that Buddha spoke of, or that Jesus spoke from, to that same level of consciousness awake within us, and yet we master the art of living in the world of time without getting lost in the world of time. This is the model that has to, uh, the model of enlightenment that has to awaken in our uh, world. Maybe there'll be a few rare souls that awaken to a, a totally transcendent level and stay there. But at that transcendent level, you cannot function in the world of time. It's not possible. You need people to take care of you. And I am speaking from experience, not from reading a book. Okay? Thank you for your question. 
Let's all be present. Because in this moment there is no Ramana, there is no Buddha, there is no Jesus. But there is God. God is the silent presence at the very heart of all things present. And there's not the Buddha here, but there is a Buddha here. And I'm not speaking about myself. I'm speaking about anyone who is truly present in this moment. Then just for this moment, you are a Buddha. If you're truly present, your mind is silent. You're utterly present with what is here. You're feeling, sensing the oneness, the isness. Then, in this moment, and only in this moment, you are a Buddha. But the moment you think about that, you're not. If you say, I am a Buddha, I would have to immediately ask you, and who is a Buddha? I am. Then you just transcended Buddha. If you declare, I am enlightened, I would immediately ask you, who is enlightened? You just transcended enlightenment. Who is I am? That's it. Beyond that, there is nothing. And I am that too. Or thou art that too. There's no limit, no boundary. No beginning, no end. Just this. Okay, so given that there's nothing beyond this, it seems to me this would be a good time to end the evening. Yes, Mary? I have a few minutes, This is for our uh, people joining us by webcast. Just to let everyone know that Leonard will be uh, running a residential retreat in Japan, April 19th to 21. And he will be in China running 
three different retreats, uh, the month of May. And of course, we have our Mount Madonna retreat, uh, March 13th through 17th, and we do have a few spaces available. We have camping and a few beds left in the women's dorm. And, and Denmark. Oh, Denmark. Denmark will be their May 22nd to the 26th residential retreat. So Provence? Provence, October 5th through 12th. Okay. Thank you, Mary. You're very welcome. And I'd just like to encourage the people who are uh, joining us by webcast tonight to consider making a donation. It is, here in the States, it's tax deductible. We are a nonprofit, and it is greatly appreciated. It really does make a difference in us being able to continue to um, provide these webcasts for free. So I thank you. Thank you, Mary. What time is it? 8, 8. Perfect. Shall we spend a few more moments together in presence? Okay, folks, so that's a good time to wrap it up. Thank you all for your presence, and um, un until we meet again.
Oh, is this still running? I just wanted to say hello, so I'll say it from here. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> Doing well. All right. Although, yeah, one night I woke up or something. Uh, I think about it.